Well, it is time for some special on-location content filmed in sunny California with BJB Enterprises. Now, this video was originally intended just to be one video, but I split it into two parts because there's so much to it. So in part one that you're watching now, this is about 3D printed molds and casting foam into those molds. And part two will be a step-by-step -step process of casting TC277 flexible foam into that 3D printed mold. So again, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy the content. Okay, well we are here with uh, Troy from BJB and coming to you from the beautiful sunny Southern California countryside. And uh, Troy, when we were looking around the shop earlier, they had this really cool 3D printed mold for foam casting. And that got us talking about 3D printing and 3D printed molds more mm -hmm. specifically. And this is one of those areas that I know many of you have told me I need to um, get with the times on this and I'm working on that. But in the meantime, uh, Troy is already there. So we're gonna pick his brain a little bit because this is one of those molds that seeing this is like, uh, you know, seeing something from the future. So um, this is a beautiful design. So. Um, and it's for casting flexible foam. Well, I mean, this, uh, it's funny because uh, looking at this mold, I, I did this a good probably almost 10 years ago at this point. But, you know, a lot of people, 3D printing has proliferated like we kind of expected it would. And so there's a lot of new people coming into the scene that know a lot about 3D printing. They want to incorporate mold making casting materials. So more legacy type manufacturing of parts obviously married with the newest technology. And um, this was, uh, it kind of came out of a necessity where I wanted to build a teaching tool, teach myself kind of how to, how to maybe approach this. Here's, here's the part I want to make, how am I going to do it? And I kind of had to go through the, the troubles that everybody else does when they approach, how am I going to attack this mold? And there were some really interesting little uh, tidbits of uh, challenges that went, went through it. And so I had to learn uh, and adapt as I went, went through it as well. So this is basically, Nothing really special. I mean, if you look at the mold, the, the fidelity, the, the, the resolution of this printer wasn't, of this particular print isn't that amazing. But aesthetically, I didn't need, you know, an SLA quality. This, it was a very functional type of thing. And uh, I've used this a lot over the years just to kind of show some possibilities and just to think outside the box with tackling some of these, uh, these mold challenges. And so the part is this, it, on this part, it's, it's orange. It's has an orange pigment in there. And then it's uh, got a slide um, of a piece of wood that went in. And I'll actually show the, uh, if you really want to age age myself here, it was for a, a, a DIY drone from uh, a, a bygone there. era. And so at the time, uh, one of the things that used to happen when you were learning to fly or you're doing aerobatics with the drones or whatnot, they would obviously crash and you want to protect the motors as much as you could. So I wanted to build some little landing pads or some little protective pads out at the end. I started with something very, very crude and said, I think I can design something a little bit better. So then I just kind of went to the computer machine, as you like to say, and I uh, just started 3D modeling. And then I kind of worked back and then built a tool for it. So now, so this part, how on a mold like this, and this is obviously, this is perfect for, since we're you're casting a flexible foam part into a rigid mold, mm -hmm. um, the, then everything's pretty straightforward as far as that goes since this can compress. But this still is really interesting in that you've got this little slide. So explain some of that because that, that's what really intrigued me is that the way you built this allowance for the, for the, the wood landing gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially, you know, when I was looking at the, you know, tackling the problem, I, you know, I, I had these existing arms. I wanted to incorporate something that uh, fit on the end of it so that in case it hit this way or you know multiple different ways it would protect it So I knew I was gonna have to incorporate a molded piece here now Obviously if, if this was actually just th all 3d printed into here, you know How do you now demold that part? So it's got to be a slide and this is very common with you know, obviously high-end manufacturing tooling as well so yeah, just started kind of breaking it down and um, just breaking it down into simple shapes and the reason why it's kind of got this multi, uh, multi hinged, you know, which is, this is actually within foam tooling, uh, hinges are a very under talked about feature of when you build yes. tools because foams tend to be very, very fast reacting. So you've, 
you, you sort of end up in this situation where you mix up the material, you pour it in a mold, and then it's all hands on deck and you need extra hands to get clamps and, and the whole thing. And what's nice about tooling like this is, you know, if you literally, if the mold is open and you're able to pour material in there and then slam it shut. Um, so the reason why this is, this why is this all three pieces versus only two, right? So I had to pour the foam in somewhere. Yes. This is the aesthetic top, if you will, and uh, I don't want a, 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 a cut off, you know, kind of a rough fill spout, uh, you know, fill port there. I wanted to, maybe if I, ideally I could do it on the bottom. Okay, so. <laughs> So what I did is I took the part and kind of inverted it to figure out this is the way I actually wanted to pour this part. And you know, I've got this slide. And then how are you going to kind of get it in the mold and, and close up and everything? So if you look at this, that's that's the vent. So got it. Okay. Whenever you're, yeah, whenever yep. you're doing foam, foam molds, a lot of times people have vents that are just way too big and they let all that back pressure out. Or they put their thumb over it or something like that. And it's like, no, that's... <laughs> You can do that in, in worst case scenarios, but if you can design the tool around doing it right, let's do it. So what happened here was I started looking at it and I thought, okay, well that's not big enough to pour foam into, especially quickly. So I started dissecting it thinking, okay, well what if I um, had a bigger pour spout and then I wanted this nice, you know, kind of rounded geometry on it and then just have a small vent. And um, so that's kind of how this kind of came into fruition. Nice. And yeah, and it worked out pretty well. And this all ended up working well, and actually my biggest challenge was mold release. How to get a, this is a self-skinning foam, it's one of our lighter uh, self-skinning expanding foams, it's called TC277. It's kind of like a, almost like a Nerf foam Yeah, I was going to say, feeling, has, or yeah, maybe like a, like a foam sandal. It's, so it's, it's kind of stiff, it's got some nice, nice stiffness to it, but it's very lightweight. So it's only about a four pound, four, four and a half okay. pound or so uh, density. Um, and, but what happened was, is I was coming in and I was applying some, you know, spray releases or maybe some waxes or whatever, but I was still, it was still kind of grippy. Again, I did not take a lot of time to sand out the surface. If it was smoother, maybe that would have been easier and maybe I could have gotten away with just one layer of release. So I went through a whole, um, kind of prototype process of how do I get parts out? Cause I would pull a part out and it would look pretty, pretty good. And then one piece over here would just have a chunk taken out of it. Cause it just grabbed in that one spot. Cause I just didn't. So I tried more release and more release. And then I started trying, well, what if I do a combination of some mold releases? So that's what I did. I actually started off with more of like a wax based, like a paste wax. We also have a liquid wax called Challenge 95, which works really well. And the wax is good. It kind of seals the porosity, if you will, of the, of the FDM mold, but it still was kind of sticky. So then I tried a spray. I did like rocket release. Okay. Um, and the rocket e, uh, E302 is, is a great silicone for, or excuse me, um, mold release for foams because it's non-silicone. And when we typically, in, in many cases, we want to avoid a silicone-based mold release because it's a surfactant and it kind of messes up the skin. It can kind right. of some, okay. Okay. add some weird dynamics to the skin and add little pits and bubbles and things like that. So we try to avoid silicone if we can. And then I did that and they were releasing better. It still wasn't quite there for me. And I, I just was, I was trying to wrap my head around why. And just in a last ditch effort, I thought, you know, sometimes in silicone molds, when you're casting foam into it, using a talc powder tends to release very well. And it adds like almost like microscopic ball bearings and the thing just pulls out and you had a nice skin. So I thought, okay, had a base layer of wax, did a little spray of rocket release. I put a little talc powder in there, shook it out, blew it out. So it was almost not undetectable. Parts just fell out. So, nice. so in the end, even a well-designed mold, you're still gonna go through these layers of, I need to figure out what's gonna work for this geometry, this situation, and uh, yeah. And so this foam. And that foam, <laughs> and uh, the whole dynamic is uh, always a challenge. You so. know, the skin on this, I, I, I'm i glad you said that about, you said this about a four pound density, because yeah. I would not have guessed that. I would have thought just based on the skin quality, I would have thought this was your 284 that is yeah. like eight pound density. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so, uh, this is the four pound, the 277 four pound density. And then when you're packing this, so you're restricting this considerably, yeah. what would you guess that is going up to? Like maybe a six pound density or so under yeah. Probably, when it's yeah. packed like that? Okay. Yeah, typically with when you when you start applying back pressure to a molded rigid tool, you can you can apply a lot of back pressure and it's amazing how much pressure it can build. And that and again that lends itself to having molds that really seal well and are, are, are fit because 
every one of these interfaces has an opportunity for having flash. Yes. And so now you're going to have cleanup. And it, now each one of these parts, I'm going to have to come in with an exacto or some sandpaper. So you want to minimize that as much as you can. So you can build a lot of, of a, a back pressure. And the back pressure is what gives you the consistency of not only the cell structure of the foam throughout the part, but also that skin quality. And so if you have a mold that starts filling up and building back pressure, and then it springs a leak and it shoots out one side or you know it, it's leaking out of side and it's not really providing that back pressure then it sometimes the foam almost like relaxes a little bit on the inside when this thing can't take it anymore and then it opens up a little bit and then you wonder why well it looked good over here but this part of the part over here the skin isn't quite as good and usually it's because you lost back pressure at some critical point in the expansion of the foam so when you pour the foam in here this thing gets clamped and um you know, and then that vent is controlling the back pressure. And then the quantity of foam that also you put in there too. Right. So whether I put 30 grams or maybe 35 grams or 40 grams or I had to back it off, and there's a fine tuning process and then you just go from there consistently. Now, one of the other things with a 3D printed mold like this is 3D printing obviously good for the product development stage, but when we get to a stage where say we wanna make, you know, thousands of, the, of these little devils, what material would you transition to for the, if you wanted to make a rigid mold, is this, would this be a good candidate for 1630 or? Yes, okay. I, would, I would look at either, you know, potentially a filled um, low shrink castable system, like a tooling material, like a, a TC 1630. Um, and then if you are in an environment where you're really doing a lot of production, um, you could even look at like an aluminum filled uh, epoxy system Okay. We've got our TC1650 system. But again, uh, 1630 is actually an amazing workhorse because you can you could create multiple, multiple tools within a short period of time because it cures so quickly. Um, the epoxy is going to take a little bit longer to cure. So when you start looking at those materials used over, say, in vacuum forming and whatnot, you, you can inter interchange those materials a little bit here and there, and it just depends on what you need from a tool life or uh, whatever dynamics are going on there. But yeah, 1630 would be a good one for something like this. You may have to configure things a little bit differently, but um, ultimately, yeah. Uh, and then some people, yeah, I mean, they, you could maybe skip, you know, going to a full-on machined hard tooling like, a, like aluminum. Now, what... On a mold like this, on a 3D printed mold, casting foam, because this is this is totally foreign turf for me, how many of these little guys do you figure you cast out of this, this mold? Mm. Um, I easily did probably a dozen. Okay. You know, from the, the ones that initially, you know, tweaking and tuning things, the ones that didn't turn out, it might take five, six, ten, you know, castings before you really fine tune and get and get it down. Um, and then you can try different things. I tried different colors, pigmentations, and then obviously there was, you know, the mold release and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I could easily get 20, 30, 40 parts out of this. Okay. Um, but I have one tool, so it's, it's going to limit. I'm going to have to wait for things to cure and then uh, go to the next one. At what kind of numbers, and this is mainly for the, yeah. the, the viewers at home that are making these little guys and, and considering this kind of option, at what point does that number influence you to say, okay, the 3D printed mold is great, but we're doing X number of parts, and so it's time to graduate up to 1630 or whatever. Mm -hmm. what, at what point would you consider yeah. moving over to filled resin or you know aluminum mold or something like that? I think if you see this as it's, it's gonna be a continuous production, you know, and you, you're gonna be doing this for weeks or months or years on end, then you might wanna invest into doing some, some good tooling. And then the beautiful thing about this is, and again, this is a great place to sometimes prototype or even do short run production. Um, and if I have to iterate, if I got to change some geometry or say, I, you know what, I really don't like the way this is working, print another one and do it. And then once you, you know, fail fast and fall forward, then you can go look at some more production type tooling. And then, um, you know, you can always come back to this if things need to change and then just repeat the process. So it's really knowing the zone of where everything kind of fits and, and, and you know, legacy tooling and legacy mold making, it still makes a, it still makes a case, you know, at a certain point. And, but, you know, again, even someone who knows traditional tooling very well and materials, 
I like having this option, and then I like being able to have that in my toolbox because it's just another option for me to try something and not be too scared about the consequences. Um, and another thing I would say on this too, and again, someone, someone might look at this and say, well, why don't you do a silicone mold? You know, and that's, that's fair, and a lot of people do cast foam into silicone molds. But again, we're, gonna, we're talking about this particular uh, foam uh, it is a self-skinning, so we do need to build some back pressure to get a really nice... We've got people that make LARPing weapons and, you know, all sorts of props and whatnot. And again, this is a fairly lightweight foam, but it's, but it's kind of stiff. So it's perfect for stuff like that. Simulated swords, simulated just uh, shields and whatnot. But you're going to want to build some back pressure. And so if you have a, a material or, a, excuse me, a, a mold that tends to spring a leak under pressure because it's soft silicone or something, you're, you're going to be fighting that. And... I've seen where you might make a part that looks perfect, and then the next one you cast, for whatever reason, it didn't get clamped in just the right spot, or the bolt, this bolt wasn't tight enough, or whatever, and then, so then you end up throwing away, you know, material in the trash, because the mold is fighting you. The mold is not helping uh, consistency, and, and, and that's uh, where stuff like this can make a huge difference. It takes a little more time. So-called mold was really easy and quick to make, but something like this will in the end, probably work itself out to save you a lot more headache and a lot more time. Well, and guilty guilty as charged because I think, like probably a lot of people watching this, I usually think of it as kind of a graduated scale moving up from, say, we've got a 3D printed mold on this end, mm -hmm. then we've got maybe a filled resin mold or something, and then building up to a silicone mold being the top end. And I think that when you're dealing with foam, it's it's a whole different <laughs> it's a whole different yeah. animal. So, uh, but do you have time for a cast with this? Yeah, do we let's... have time to throw some foam in here and see how it goes? Yeah, we should definitely give it a shot. Excellent. Okay. All right. We're gonna now cast some foam. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, I've linked part two here on the end screen, so be sure to check that out. Click the link here for part two, and in this video. Troy walks us through a step-by-step -step process of the release protocol and the casting process for casting TC277 into a 3D printed mold. Now, as always, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. And of course, be sure to click the link for the next video. And thanks for watching.